Hello, I'm Sandra Gilman, chairman of the American Theatre Wing, with our board president, Doug Leeds. Welcome to today's program, where we'll be talking with American playwright Horton Foote and exploring his tremendous body of work with our distinguished panel. We'll be back later to tell you more about the work of the American Theatre Wing. But right now, please join us for another edition of Working in the Theatre. He's one of America's leading playwrights, and his long, enduring theatrical career has spanned more than six decades. Hello, I'm Howard Sherman for the American Theatre Wing, and we're joined today by Horton Foote. Welcome, Horton. Thank you. Do you think your work has changed over the course of your career? Well, it better have, in the sense that I, I, I'm, I hope I've improved as a writer. Well, first of all, I didn't think I was going to be a playwright. I thought I was going to be an actor the rest of my life. And we were down, we joined a little company called the American Actors Company. And this was way before Off-Broadway. There was no Off-Broadway. But we established this little company by renting some space over a garage and building a little kind of informal theater. And um, some wonderful people were, were, were part of all that, that location. Um, Agnes DeMille was one of them. And she came down to investigate doing a work with us. And part of her process was that we improvised the different sections that we came from. And I was busy doing Texas, and she called me over and she said, did you ever think about writing? And I said, no, I never did. And she said, well, I think you should. And I said, well, what, what would I write about? And she said, write about what you know. Well, that's very primitive, but it stuck here somewhere. And uh, I decided to try a one-act play, and mainly to, because I thought I could do one for the part for myself. And um, I wrote it, and the company accepted it. And they did it on a program of one act with uh, Thornton Wilder and uh, Paul Green and a man from the Daily News, the Daily Mirror, Robert Coleman, came down to see the play and praised me. He liked my acting as much as he liked my writing. So I thought, well, that's how it is. So I was in a show called The Railroads on Parade in the World's Fair, where I had to change my clothes 10 times during the run of the whole day and uh, saved my money, went to Texas, and in the living room of my mother and father's house, I wrote a play called Texas Town, which again, I played the lead. I came back, and the American Actors Company were delighted. I said, let's do it. So they did, and uh, they, we moved up to the 16th Street, where uh, uh, Doris Humphrey and had a, th a theater and had more space than we did. And we did the play Texas Town there, and Brooks Atkinson decided to come down. Why, I don't know. And it was a glorious review, except for one thing. He didn't like my acting. Have you ever been tempted to act again? No. <laughs> Horton Foote had his first play produced off-Broadway in 1941, and his subsequent plays have graced both large and small stages in New York and regional theaters around the country. He was a sought-after writer during television's golden age, and he discussed that experience during a 1992 broadcast of Working in the Theater. I was in television really mainly at a time when it was very near theater. It, we, it, was not, it wasn't really like cinema at all. And uh, we had were limited to two or three sets. Uh, we were based in New York. We used New York actors. Um, we rehearsed them as we rehearsed plays. You couldn't stop them. In other words, they had to have a continuity like a play. You couldn't stop and cut. So I really used television that time to, to develop and write one-act plays, which no one wanted in those days. And uh, they since have been published as one-act plays and they're done all over. But, uh, 
I learned, certainly you learn from anything. He also had great success as a screenwriter, winning Academy Awards for you To Kill a Mockingbird and Tender Mercies. Is writing for film different? I don't write not for film, but I don't know what writing for film is. I kind of bring all the baggage that I have and try it out in film. With two Academy Awards, it's <laughs> remarkable to hear you say you don't know what writing for film is. Well, I don't really. I mean, in other words, I'm not, I'm not a practitioner of film writing. Hmm. What I've learned about film writing is from people around me, I trust, the directors and the, the actors. And, uh, and, the, and in the case of Mockingbird, the source material, which I have learned that I'd better get things that I really feel strongly about and can emotionally be in succinct with or else I'm in trouble. In other words, I'm not the writer you should hire for a horrendous tale in the Bronx. I could be moved by that, but not as a writer. Do you find yourself thinking of stories and say to yourself, this should be a play or this should be a film? Well, <clears throat> I, I would hope I could make that distinction. Um, mostly the things that come to me have some essence that I could accept. Um, but in my adaptations, the, I mean, I, I'm most eager to do anything of Faulkner's that they would like me to do. Um, and. There are a number of writers that I would be flattered and honored to do. Um, but uh, beyond that, I have no real sense of what a film is or not a film. Uh, I know that you, uh, uh, for instance, in Bountiful, which was first done on television, then is a play, then is a film. I knew that, that in the film I could go places that I couldn't go in the play or in the, even the television because the, the cameras were very limited. So that was an, an enormous joy to me to be able to do that. And I didn't go very far, but I did stop a couple of times and uh, I, I found it enriched the final product. But he never abandoned his love of theater. His extraordinary body of work examines the constant struggle between the past and present. What is it about the relationship of the past to the present that speaks to you? Well, I don't know that it's a longing for the past, but a, an abiding interest in the past. Um, and that started when I was around 10 years old. I, uh, I couldn't get enough of the stories. I had a, a very large family I was a part of, and they were, went through many things that seemed to me very dramatic, and like golf storms and um, the reconstruction. And um, so I couldn't get enough of it. And I was always asking questions and listening, and uh, it became very real to me in some ways. Um, and that's the thing that has probably embraced my playwriting, that longing. Uh, I would hope I'm not sentimental about the past because I know a great deal of its faults and it probably wouldn't choose to live there if I could. But uh, the interest grows as I get older and what was the past became the present and then becomes the past again. You've made the choice to write many of your plays based upon your family, as you just mentioned. Well, uh, dissected. Uh, it's never really a person. 
that I'm known, it's a combination who become a different person, if that makes any sense. At times, though, you've written about people who you've had to wait to write about. Well, because they're smart. And I knew that even the slightest indication, they would say, that's me. And I don't want any of that. But then, once they've passed, what is your comfort level about portraying even a portion of them in the work? Well, I don't have any comfort level. Uh, I don't want to upset people. or um, That's not my goal. Um, but I want to be true to what, what I feel is the essence of the past. And uh, I'm still listening. I'm going back and I'm listening. And um, I find great comfort in it some, in some ways. From the trip to Bountiful to the Carpetbaggers' Children, countless productions of Horton Foote's 60 plays have illuminated the drama of daily life. The 1994 season of the Signature Theatre Company was devoted to his work, and in 1995 he won a Pulitzer Prize for The Young Man from Atlanta, which received a Tony nomination on Broadway in 1997. Given the longevity of your career, you are now pretty much always the most senior person in the room. <laughs> and I'm wondering whether that affects how you interact with the companies now as opposed to in the past? Oh, Lord, I don't know, but I wouldn't want to be designated as, well, how would I say this? That I, I was insisting on my seniority. Uh, no, that, that never occurs to me. Hmm. Uh, but I am happy to, to be working with younger people and I'm learning all the time, and it's a, a part of my life that's very dear to me. Just as you say you're learning, are you also having to teach them about the life in Harrison, Texas that you portray so often? Well, I think, I, 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 if, if they veer toward, well, let's put it this way. If they're working on something that I've written about Harrison, Texas, I feel that's as much information as they need. But whatever questions they have, I'm happy to answer. Any doubts or, or confusion that they may feel about the material, I'm happy to explore it with them. There was a time in your life when you left both New York and California to live in northern New England. And I'm wondering whether that hiatus from those capitals of theater and film had an impact on your work. Well, it, it, it did, although I don't know how conscious the attempt was to affect my work. It's been a little misunderstood, my leaving the theater. I didn't really leave the theater. I felt the theater was going through a phase that was interesting to me, but I didn't feel really related to me at all. I mean, the first nudity and the first four-letter words that were introduced, I mean, I was interested in their effect and what it was doing to the theater, but it really wasn't my territory. So I, uh, for whatever reason, we decided to go to New Hampshire. And I was there for a spell, a lot, a fairly long spell, and I wrote a lot. But I was writing on my terms and for myself, and then sending the plays out, and sometimes they were done, but more, more rarely not. But they're being done now in many different phases. And the same with film, it never occurs to me that I'm going to start a film. Usually it's by invitation. But here, again, I wrote and, and was part of one of my films that I loved, if any of them, Tomorrow, with Robert Duvall. And uh, that was done on the cuff, you might say. 
I don't think it costs more. I don't want to say how much it costs because I, I don't really remember exactly. But it was for, uh, you couldn't even turn around in a Hollywood studio for what we paid. It was done in Mississippi, on location, and it was indeed a work of love, but uh, how I like best to work in films. How do you see theater as having evolved over the course of your career? Uh, as an actor, I went out with, uh, uh, with the Theater Guild's production of, of a Hemingway play called The Fifth Column. I had a small part, and I learned that in the, on the road, you could be cut out of a play. Uh, and that still goes, I think, if you go out of town. But I realized that, that there were th theater towns, Philadelphia, Boston, t cities like that, that they chose to take the plays first. Well, that's almost a, a vanished out of our theater. There's a whole new system now of how to do, well, they may, I guess the most famous is the out-of-town tryouts or, or, or theaters that are established of their own merit. The regional theaters. Regional theater. Uh, all that made a, has made a great difference. Uh, and then the other thing is the shrinking of the New York theater. Uh, Off-Broadway is still flourishing and the, the way I've just had a play done is uh, there are a number of producers like that and they're very helpful uh, and a lot of good work is done there. Another thing that's so different is that the cost of a play or a film is just out of sight. Do you find yourself writing for particular actors? No, no. I, somewhere back here is something telling me this is good or bad for certain people. And I know early on, but I really couldn't do that because I'm trying to f go into another world and uh, inviting them to join me. And I know pretty soon who I want, don't always get, but I want. And uh, usually it's a very happy time. He was awarded the National Medal of Arts in 2000, and this season, Dividing the Estate had its New York premiere at primary stages. Now, Sutton says you don't get much from an oil lease. That's true. You have to, you have to, the big money starts when you, when you strike oil. Well, how much do we get from an oil lease? Depends how bad they want the lease. Well, how much? I hear lately some people are getting $20,000 for a year. $20,000? Is that all? That's all, and that's tops around here. As we continue our conversation with this gifted writer, we're joined by several artists who have had sustained working relationships with Horton in recent years. His daughter, David actress Hattie Hallie Foote, James Houghton, artistic director of Signature Theatre, Andrew Lindsay, artistic director of Primary Stages, and Michael Wilson, artistic director of Hartford Stage. Welcome and thank you to all for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. So much of Horton's work takes place in the town of Harrison, Texas. How is it that the work in that specific locale, the stories of that particular town, play wherever his work is seen? Jim, I want to ask you that first. Well, I, I think for, for that particular location, it's really about an internal life um, that is unique to Horton and his unique perspective on the world. And I think we call it Harrison, Texas in, in his plays, and he calls it that, but it's really more or less a universal uh, struggle uh, that, and common struggle that we all have to pass through a life in a fulfilling way and, <laughs> and to feel uh, connected to the world and to one another. And I think that's really Harrison, Texas. So I think it is universal. It's, a, it's ultimately about the relationships we have with one another. So that's, that's what I think. Is Harrison, Texas seen differently in New York than, say, in Hartford, Connecticut, Michael? Well, I, I, don't, I don't think so. I, I mean, I think about uh, Eudora Welty and what she writes about the, the sense of place and Southern writing. And I, I think Harrison is such a, 
a, a vivid place in Horton's plays, and it's made vivid to us as artists that have worked on his plays, and vivid to the uh, to the audiences because the characters and the situations and the stories are so specific, and because the writing is so specific, it becomes universal. Andrew, in planning a season, does Horton's work fill a particular need? Well, I think, as always, um, what his work does is it, it resonates on, um, even for New Yorkers um, and this environment, you would think Texas at 59th Street, would that resonate? But his, it, because the work is so specific and it goes to the stories and the characters and the audience, seeing that within the characters being portrayed, that story happening on the stage, that's what's so specific and it resonates in a great way. So I think that's what we look to when we say, oh, we have Horton again. <laughs> I think, too, if I, I can add, you know, in a way, when you look at Chekhov and Horton is often, uh, people often, often make concer com comparisons to Horton and Chekhov. Y you know, we don't invest necessarily in uh, three sisters and their desire to be in Moscow, uh, to, to go to Moscow. Uh, we we invest in the journey, and I think that's how it's universal. It's a specific thing, as you were saying, mm -hmm. Michael, but ultimately it becomes universal in that it's it's a longing to be, and uh, that's what I think is so extraordinary about Horton's work. It's in this particular canvas, but the canvas becomes uh, much broader than than its uh, initial uh, parameter. But in that sense of place, Hallie, I'm wondering you were not raised in Texas, no. it's, your, it's where your father's from. Did you, as you began playing the roles in his works, did you go back to find out more about the life there? Well, not so much. I mean, I, I, I would go back on visits. You know, my family would spend holidays there. We'd go back for, you know, weeks at a time or something. <clears throat> but um, it's like all those things. I was raised on the stories, I think my father there's a rich history of storytelling, particularly in the South. And even now when we go down there, you know, the same stories over and over, you never get tired of them. And I think that's sort of what families are like, you know, they kind of revisit and talk about things that they've experienced, talk about things that they've heard about. Um, so it seemed very real and alive to me all my life, even though I didn't live there. And maybe that's what sort of informed me in terms of understanding the way he writes. In the case of the current production of Dividing the Estate, Horton, you have been at virtually every performance. I'm wondering, first of all, from you, why do you choose to see your show so often? Because I'm an egomaniac. <laughs> <laughs> and part of the delight, which I hadn't realized until the other day, is sitting there and people are coming out and saying, I enjoyed it, or I, you know, they never say they didn't like it, and uh, <laughs> it's just a very nice, a small town feeling, let's say. And they'll they'll say, well, this is the third time I've seen this play, or I'm coming back, or I saw the last one you did here, or I saw it over at the Signature, and uh, it's a little community. Uh, but if they got critical. And abusive, I don't think I'd, say, I'd get up and leave. But as you watch every performance, do you become critical? Are you watching to I, see how uh, it's playing? Well, you know, I'm very pro-actor. I really think the actors are, and the directors, of course, but I, I, I welcome seeing a performance uh, repeated or not repeated, or, or the attempt to repeat. You can't really in the theater repeat. You can approximate, but you can't, it's just not, in a movie you can run it over and over and over and over and over. But you'd learn something each, each time the, the, the is performed. You know what they bring to it, you know what, what they add to it. And uh, it really, the theater is a cooperative proposition in a way that none of the others are maybe dance, but, uh, and it, a company becomes a family. So that at Signature, I've been with two families. 
and the signature I've been with five families or six families. In primary stages, I've been with two here and one in when we were in a smaller theater. Uh, so it's interesting that each theater brings the ch bears the stamp of the person that formed it. I mean, you can. But that family yeah. sense, I think, comes from you, <coughs> Horton, a, a, a lot. As I mean, and, and I think your love of actors is what makes your presence in the rehearsal hall such a welcome one instead of an intimidating one for the actors as they're discovering well, and exploring. might be, Michael, might be, <clears throat> because I was just going to take us to Hartford, which is mm -hmm. very different than New York. Mm -hmm. but, the act, but the relationship of the audience to the play is the same. Mm -hmm. And you sense it immediately. And, uh, for instance, Trip to Bountiful had two productions, one at Michael's Theatre and one at, at uh, Signature. They were different and yet they were the same. What is the impact on your companies of having Horton there and indeed for an extended period of time? It's fantastic. It's, you know, look, I, I think all of us, uh, well, I would hazard a guess, believe that having the presence of the writer in the room brings that world of play to life in a way that it, it's impossible to capture in any other way. And Horton's particular investment uh, is infectious and, and alive and, and bright, and it, it, it heightens the experience, um, the overall experience of whatever endeavor you're, you're after. We've done six projects together, and he's been in every rehearsal uh, of every project and nearly every performance, as you've already said. The thing that I, I think is interesting about Horton, because often you'll hear people, sorry for talking about you, with you here, Horton, as if you're not here, but they'll talk about Horton's presence and his generosity and his, his quiet presence. Um, and, and all of that's true. But Horton Foote is one fierce fighter. He is a prize <laughs> fighter. <laughs> and he has um, a, a, a very targeted and fascinating way of working that allows people to feel comfortable, but uh, his presence is ever present in that room. Um, and he does it through the empowerment of the artists mm -hmm. and his collaborators, as he's just talked about. Yet he is a fierce collaborator in that process. Um, and, and his fierceness can come through in the most gentle ways. Yeah. Um, by the way, Horton, that you will ask questions about maybe a run through you've just seen, and and the way that he might phrase it, say on dividing the state. Even I'm just asking questions, Michael, about what we just saw, <laughs> and, and and really trying to f figure out like where are where is the play going, and is it something that the <laughs> actors still haven't discovered, or have I not unlocked, or is it in fact something that he st still would like to adjust himself, and he's. He's never one, Horton, you're never one to say, oh, that's all the actors and the director's problem. And he is such a total man of the theater. He really understands those interlocking pieces. And as, and as far as um, his presence at, at a theater company, um, that, ex that extends beyond the work on the stage as well. I mean, first of all, the plays themselves, I think, are, are so distinctive and they capture the American experience so vividly for audiences. And I ultimately think they're really unconventional plays. Because that's just it. A lot of people think of Horton Foote as a, an old-fashioned um, writer of conventional two or three act structures. Even yeah, Danny Mary was three. Not at all. No. Uh, and, and the way that um, stillness and silences are embraced and encouraged. Uh, it creates a, a, a kind of reality on stage that you you rarely see anymore. And um, and well, also the humor. It's it strikes me always has struck me how much dividing the estate is a comedy, and people wouldn't expect that with <coughs> subject matter being death in the family, dividing up your family estate, and all that involved. And I think that that goes back to um, the family, and we, we mentioned this a lot, and I think one of Horton's great strengths and one of the things that we love 
is that he, he surrounds himself with great interpreters of his work. And as, an, as a leader of an institution, um, not, not only do you feel embraced in this world, but you know that you're going to have around you, um, like Michael, to be that interpreter, or Hallie. And also, obviously, having the institutions like Signature Theater and Primary Stages as being part of those um, institutions that embrace and support um, new work. Well, you know, also, my father didn't have a home. He didn't have a home for his plays. And the three of you, it started really with you, Jim, and, and Kurt Dempster at EST. Um, and he had a play reviewed by Frank Rich. And that sort of bega began his so re emerging right. into the New York scene. But you know, you three, he feels, he, and I think that's why he goes to the plays. He, he feels like it's part of his home and family. And every night, the audience is different, and he gets to experience it in a different way. But if it hadn't been for the three of you, he just wouldn't have had this opportunity, I don't think, in the same way. And that goes to the whole issue of how important institutional theaters are, yeah. like all of ours, where it <coughs> provides that safe environment to develop new work, because it's becoming smaller and smaller. The venues, there are not very many out there anymore. I'm in my 10th season at Hartford Stage, and when I look back over those years, my relationship with Horton and the work that we've done together, I feel is the greatest achievement of, of the body of work that we've accomplished at the theater. And I feel by doing a, a, one of his you know, mo most famous plays, the, the Broadway play Trip to Bountiful, and then the premiere of Death of Papa that ended the uh, Orphan's Home Cycle, and then The Carpetbagger's Children, which was a really wildly abstract play, uh, and a, an extremely poetic play, and very unconventional, and extremely daring and innovative. Grace Ann began to cry in the middle of the song. And I looked at Cornelia, and she looked like death, I thought. But she wasn't crying. And I looked at my daughter, and at Mama, and Mrs. Carpenter, and then I heard a car come down the street. And I said a prayer. Please, God, let it be Leon Davis. But before I could finish my prayer, I heard the car pass and head on into town. I've been so honored to have been one of the Harvard Stage to have been one of those homes for Horton. And, you know, I feel like there's still so much to be done. Is there something that you look for when entrusting your work to a director or a theater company? Well, it's a feeling. I don't know that I know it mentally. But I, <clears throat> I started, really started out with Jim because I was doing a play at the Lambs Theater, I yeah, think, yeah. You know? yeah. Um, which Hallie had just given a brilliant performance in. And um, Jim came down with one other playwright, I don't remember. Was who. The, I think it was Lee Blessing who was Lee Blessing, him. yeah. And uh, they asked me if I would like to have a series of plays. And I thought about it, you know, because it's scary. As hell. I kept saying, who is this Jim Houghton? <laughs> <laughs> and we should say this was in '94, so it was only about yeah, the third 90, season. It was, like 93. It was '93. '93. Actually, that conversation happened. Uh, when did you do that? '92. '92. That conversation. It was '92 into '93. It was '92 and '93. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. A Horton, my God, I, I've been a huge fan of his work for years, and mm -hmm. um, I thought. Uh, how much better can it get than having a season of Horton Foot here in town? But anyway, I'm sorry, Horton. But you that were that was uh, the, what. Well, I had always I had had the American Actors Company. I was much younger, and there was this feeling of family, and I sensed this from signature immediately, and um, I it was the happiest time I'd ever had in the theater uh, because of the work of the actors and the directors and because of Jim's sense of place and what the function of the theater should be. Not to grind out hits, not to do anything, but quietly to establish 
a precedent of theater work. And uh, I had little to do with that, but I certainly partook up, but took part of it, took part in it, and uh, became a changed, changed person. I remember that season at the Campos Arts Center. It was yeah. fantastic. <laughs> the productions were just extraordinary. And this scrappy young man, I think, was out there with a cigar box <laughs> taking people's money for the tickets. And he said, we don't I have mean, money, you know, but we'll give you chocolate. He used to bring us <laughs> chocolate. <laughs> and I, I remember the, the drunk that you played. Oh, Velma. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. What play? What I, was Laura that? Dennis. Laura Dennis. Laura Dennis. Yeah. And, and, and again, a character like that, one of the things I find so remarkable about Horton's work, he treats all of his characters with such respect and dignity. And I, even when and they're in the midst of great troubles and sorrows, he, he approaches them with this respect and dignity. And I think the respect and dignity that he gives his characters, he gives to his collaborators. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't mean that he's not fierce, and it doesn't yeah. mean he's yeah. not going to push you and everyone else for the very best. But he does it out of immense trust, and I think it, that's a beautiful feeling. And you don't you don't often have that. I'll just say this one thing, because I'm. He, I think who spoke about carpet baggage children? I Michael. Did. Michael. That grew. It is abstract, I guess. Um, but I was commissioned by the Alley Theater to mm -hmm. do this work. And I didn't know what to do, and I said just loosely, well, I think I'll do a kind of a homage to uh, the Three Sisters. <laughs> that sounded awful fancy. <laughs> <laughs> but that's really what, what was this, what impelled that work. And what was wonderful, going back to your earlier conversation, the regional theater movement, we were able to premiere it at the Alley, then go to the Guthrie, then to Hartford, and then ultimately into Lincoln Center. And it was through mm -hmm. the, that whole path, the journey for mm -hmm. the production and play that it evolved. Um, and Jim helped us get the Guthrie, didn't he? I think you did. Very much so. Yeah. Yes, you so were. Lesson, you were, again, this is like all these guys kind of collaborate. Because that, in your great. capacity there with Joe. Yeah. It, it's interesting, while we're talking about carpetbaggers, for, for the viewers who've seen Dividing the Estate, the house that Dividing the Estate is set in is the house uh, at where Carpetbaggers at the end, which is being dedicated with the National um, his Historic Registry. And the story about the great-grandfather and the Reconstruction is an echo of a story that's told in the Carpetbaggers' children. It's wonderful hearing those thematic yeah, reverberations yeah, exactly. to the plays. The New York Times, uh, Charles Isherwood wrote a long piece that talked about your writing as political. I want to explore a little more this idea that people have a perception of what Horton's work is and what your perception of that work is, because it seems like there may be a disconnect. How, do you, how would you each describe the work of Horton Foote? Andrew, I'll start with you. Well, I mean, it's political in the sense that it's personal, um, and it speaks to me on a personal level. And, you know, Families, um, individual politics within families, um, within small towns, within small communities. I think that's, that is the politics of it. And the politics is simple yet extremely complex. And so you can have a situation that in, in this very calm and methodical way that we can enter into this world and, and learn about an estate in this case that's going to be separated and, and, and the, the impending separation of that. And all of a sudden we found ourse find ourselves in the, into the, the worlds of these characters and that's the politics of it. Um, it's how can people, one, strive to do, you know, strive for money when there's family right next to them and, and what are those politics? So I find it, it's a very personal politics. I, I think, uh, to me, it, it, it goes all from truth, that Horton, first and foremost, writes the truth. And I'll never forget uh, for Trip to Bountiful, when I saw that movie, I was preparing to leave North Carolina to go away from home, as opposed to Mother Watts going back to home, and it absolutely devastated me. 
I would like a uh, ticket to Bountiful, please. Where? To uh, Bountiful. Uh, what's it near? It's between Harrison and, and uh, Cotton. And that was a very personal mm. play and a very personal journey that doesn't feel political, really, in any real sense at all, unless you want to say that it's about how we treat our elderly here in, a, in, our, in America. But a play like Dividing the State, I think Horton has truthfully um, caught hold of the, the greed that comes out of desperation and what happens when economic forces that are much larger than any of uh, you know, individuals' control uh, began to crush uh, families and subset of families. And I think that kind of truthful um, transcendence of behavior and motives becomes something that is political and makes us look at what is our American character and how are we motivated and driving ourselves both as individuals and as a society and as a community and ultimately as a nation. Um, what do we value anymore? Do we value family? Do we value home? Or do we value a lot of money so that we can have consumer capitalism and have as much materialism as we might be able to afford. You know, Horton doesn't wear his politics, uh, wear, wear his politics on, it, on his sleeve in these plays. You have to dig down to what is the core of, uh, of politics, which is ultimately about, uh, you know, social uh, justice. It's about truth. It's mm -hmm. about a personal truth, a, a truth that is universal, all of those things. And when you uh, pare down a Horton's place. First of all, they're full of uh, extremely important events. It's another misconception that yep. Horton's plays are slow, uneventful uh, ruminations about uh, a particular circumstance. But when you actually break down the actions that take place in Horton's plays, they're <laughs> massive and important, and the stakes are as high as they get on a personal level for those individual characters. And ultimately, that's what politics is about. It's about things that are important to individuals that ultimately affect society and uh, reflect a political point of view. I thought Isherwood's piece was incredibly astute mm -hmm. and long overdue in terms uh, of this particular thing. Just listen to all of these articulate statements about what people are seeing in your work. Are you consciously thinking about that when you're writing? No. Or is, are these things people reveal to you after? Well, I, I, I don't think so. I, uh, <clears throat> I think I go back to a source that's um, kind of sustained me, which is um, my beginnings in Harrison. Mm -hmm. And it hasn't all changed that much, you know. Um, in some ways it's changed radically. Uh, it's a, uh, on one level, it's a foreign town to me now because the people that I was kin to and the, the, the large extended family all disappeared. I mean, they're dead. And um, institutions and ways of living are changing mm -hmm. drastically. But underneath, there is the same quiet, undisturbed town that's sure of itself, and not always wisely so, but it has a kind of center. And uh, I find myself, it takes me back to the past often, but I find myself connecting with that. The minute I hear the word, um, and people have started coming down here from Wharton to see the plays, I think nine of them came down for this last play, and for Bountiful they came down. Um, that's on the one hand frightens me because I don't want them ever to feel I'm exploiting them or that I'm using them as for dramatic purposes, but also it pleases me because they, are, they sense that that thing that makes Harrison Harrison, or Wharton Wharton, and uh, unmistakably so. Harrison is, is a reminder that we did come from someplace, 
And that's where Horton came from, but we all of us came from a place. And part of what's happened with the uh, you know, ever-increasing technology um, and the, the, just the rapid forms of communication and, is that we, we've become so dislocated from our past. But I think and we're also all trying to survive, you know, yeah. and yeah. endure. Mm -hmm. It's like, is it, was it Beckett, we can't, can't go on, I must go on? I will go on. I will go on. <laughs> right. But, you know, it's, it's that feeling. And I feel that in a lot of his plays, the characters are, are exploring that mm. and trying to figure that out. Because Mother Watts says the same thing mm -hmm. in Bountiful. What are you going to do now, and Mother Watts? it's sort of like, well, we're going to end with dividing <laughs> say we're all going to live, you know, we're going to right. figure something out. Well, that's the affirming part of the yeah. plays, is that, see, ultimately, there's a very affirmative, for me, um, message in them, is that they're... Life will go on, and you can go on with it. There's a resiliency that he gives his characters. Even when it gets tough and terrible, there's a kind of a hopeful thing. Hopefulness that to the fierceness. I think, I think <laughs> of uh, The Roads to Home, <clears throat> which is about the journey of a woman who ends up in an mm -hmm. in, in asylum. Um, and then we did another play, which The Roads to Home is not mentioned. This character is not mentioned. But through a, a vista to the institution, we find out that she's in this, in this uh, institution. Was, right. the, and she's Last brought time. out Last only time. one time on the stage, and she's sitting there, and all of a sudden she says, I want to go home. Mm -hmm. I want, I cry right now when I think about it. Mm -hmm. And people would just weep. And this actress had this one line. Mm -hmm. And because they had this, residue thing that we all want to go home, I suppose, no matter how. Your plays let us go home. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And even if it's not a permanent, a physical experience, it's one that we can take inside yeah. and, and it becomes an internal yeah. one. I find that your work, what it does for me is it, it liberates me from the burden of uh, having to define a home, but that the home is the journey itself. Yeah. It's the ever uh, <clears throat> present challenge to live, to live fully, mm -hmm. to live with awareness, to live with generosity, to uh, keep reaching deeper and deeper, to find purpose, to find a sense of self. And there are times when I, I, I've witnessed this in you where I see a deep sense of purpose in you and other times when you're struggling to find that purpose. And that unlocking that wisdom for all of us through your plays, through your presence, personal presence, is to me the thing that liberates us to live without knowing necessarily, but to live fully and trying to understand. Yeah. A unique thing about me as a writer is I have a daughter. Yes. I don't write for, but often when it's finished I think, well, that's the part for her. Um, and, and she understands your music. Yeah, she does. and then the uh, <laughs> from, so. from primary stages before we reached our grand state now that we're in, <laughs> a rather primitive state, uh, I, they allowed me to do a direct a play of my daughter's. Of Not Daisy. my Daisy. Oh, Daisy's. 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 And then she played one of the leads. Right. Yeah. Well. And I don't know who said it, but someone said, we gave nepotism a, a good nepotism name. Nepotism. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> but you know, there must be a unique dynamic to doing your father's work. And can you talk a little about that? I, you know, it's hard for me to talk about because I don't really understand it. You know, I just have a feeling about what he writes, and I trust the feeling. And mm. I don't try to judge it. I don't try to analyze it. I used to. It just doesn't work to do that. Um, I have, a, I have an ear for, and I think it's with a lot of writing, I don't think it's just his, but uh, particularly his, that if it just doesn't feel right to me or, you know, it doesn't feel right in my body, I'll say something, you know, I'll say this isn't, and so when I'm being directed by, you know, Michael or Jim or, um, or talking to my dad, they'll try and help me figure it out, and sometimes they might do like a little rewriting or, but a lot of times it's just approaching it in a different way. Mm -hmm. I, and I don't know what else to say about it. And really. some, certainly some of the plays that you've appeared in were not new plays. Mm -hmm. Some of them, in case of something like Bountiful, 
it's a 50 year old play. The part mm -hmm. was not written for you. But I had, now that's interesting. With Bountiful, uh, I wanted to explore her. I didn't want her to be a caricature. And I tried really, 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 really hard. And right. you did the same thing with Dividing the Estate, though. Yeah, and, to and find Mary Jo, because I think it's really easy to leap and, and just say, okay, because on the surface it's a certain kind of an act, uh, character. But you really owe it to the character and you owe it to the play to dig as deep as you can and make it so it really connects and feels like it's really part of you. It's not just something you're commenting on. Mm -hmm. Surely you're not going out and auditioning for these, though. So mm -hmm. in some of the plays, it would seem there might be multiple roles that you could conceivably play. Mm -hmm. How do you arrive at what is the right role for Hallie? I generally ask. Yeah. <laughs> I'll read it. It's like, give it to me, yeah. and I'll ask. And I, sometimes and we've talked about yeah, it, too. Yeah, we've gone I'll back and forth saying, you know, should it be this one or that one, and right. pros and, and it's cons. interesting. I know the, the one I played, that drunken woman. Yeah, I didn't no. think, Jim called me up, he said, okay, Hallie, I want you to play this part. And I'm like, I don't think I'm, he, you kind of convinced me for that To one. go out there on that and the, Yeah, that was, at one point Jim did this, <laughs> he just literally pushed me and you said, go. Because <laughs> <laughs> I was kind of holding back. So it's things like that. Yeah. Well, I think it's yeah. a process, I mean, Hallie is clearly the interpreter of mm -hmm. Horton's work. No one beats uh, her in intuition, her craft, her sense of, of world and play. I think our jobs are is to help Hallie when she gets in her own way, when she fear, because these are in very intense roles that she plays, and in a way of knowing so much, of uh, just liberating her from that burden. Um, it's all there, there's no one more delightful to work with uh, on a Horton Foot play than with Hallie Foot. She brings authenticity to the work like no one else and flies in it. I've never seen a performance that Hallie has given that hasn't been truthful and has carried uh, and propelled the play forward in Horton's world. We are in a desperate condition on the verge of bankruptcy. Do you understand? We owe money to everybody. We could lose our cars, our house. Is this true, Bob, or is it just some more Mary Jo's tale? She searches, just like the characters in his plays, and, but as an actor, she's searching, 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 and she will go down many roads and hit dead ends, and then sometimes will hit stasis, and ah, mm -hmm. what is that? And then we'll find the way out and, and begin searching another path until she finds the, the most vivid and deep truth, and, and that's also wonderful to watch. I think that's really what, what is so great about Hallie because she earns it. She constantly works on that part. It's, it's not handed to her. Mm, she right. earns yeah, this right. part. She works every single moment on this play. And, and to see her in roles like Trip to Bountiful, to mm. Dividing the State, to The Day Emily Married, very distinctively different characters. And the range is quite amazing. She is a true professional. Number one. There'll be no more running away. There'll be no more running away. Good. Number two, no more hymn singing. When I'm in the apartment, when I'm gone, you can sing your lungs out. Agree? Agree. We often shy away from, I think, stating the obvious about an artist such as Horton because we assume everyone knows <laughs> it. But Horton, I speak directly to you. You are. Uh, a gift to this uh, community. You, you are unique. You have, for over 60 plays and many decades, been fearless in, in your uh, willingness to explore what comes to you through instinct and through your talents and your gifts. And I know all of us, um, what we, we do everything we can to make as many people aware of that clearly the world of theater itself does that, but it's essential that it is recognized in the, our community, our broader community, of the importance of your contribution to the American theater and to the world of theater. Um, these things are often recognized many, many decades later. It's important to recognize that now. Yeah. You're humbling me. I'm going to get on this table and hide. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a big responsibility. But. If it happens, you're part of the journey. 
And I, and I, I mean, I know that um, those of people that I've been fortunate to work with uh, have created whatever this myth is about me. More than 60 plays, 91 years. Do you still have tor stories left that you want to tell? Uh, what do you mean? <laughs> Are there more plays to come? Oh, Lord, I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. Um, we hope so. It's up to these gentlemen, <laughs> because I have to, uh, in some sense, know that I'm wanted and that I'm just not working in a vacuum. Um, I don't really feel that. I know that you've all been beyond the call of duty. Um, yes, I, I, I can't wait to get back to quietness and to, I do need quiet to write. And uh, We're going to Texas for a month, so. Yeah. Well, with that, Horton, thank you for all of your plays and thanks to all of you thank for you. bringing us thank the you. work of Horton Foote. And thank you for joining us. These programs are brought to you from the Graduate Center of the City University of New York with our partners, CUNY TV. For the American Theatre Wing, thanks for joining us for another edition of Working in the Theatre. The American Theatre Wing has played a vital role in New York's theatrical life for more than 60 years. We stand for excellence and we support education in the theatre. Best known for creating the Tony Award, our work reaches beyond Broadway and New York. These seminar programs, which are supported by the Annenberg Foundation and the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, are an unequal forum for discussions with today's most creative artists. Downstage Center's in-depth interviews are heard on XM Satellite Radio. Our grant and scholarship programs support New York theater companies and theater students. And since we began, we have given away more than two and a half million dollars. Our theater intern group helps young people who are just starting in their careers build a professional network. And Springboard NYC is a two-week boot camp for aspiring actors from colleges across the country. All of the American Theater Wing's educational and media programs are available for free, on demand, from our website, americantheaterwing.org.